more on this, let's bring in Jonathan Shanzer. He's a former terrorism analyst at the Treasury Department and a vice president of research at the Foundation of Defense of Democracies. So, Jonathan, we heard a little bit about those complaints from lawmakers from Catherine. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we spoke to an interrogator, a former terrorist interrogator, about Gaith being in a New York court, and he felt very comfortable with it. Here's what he had to say. I think it continues to... Um reaffirm our criminal justice system for both in the U.S. and the world. I think I'm in that camp that says it's the right thing to do. U.S. district courts have a terrific record. You know, almost 200 terrorism convictions since 9-11. You've worked in terrorism, counterterrorism, Jonathan. What do you think about it? Well, I think this was a big mistake. Uh, I th we talked about this a few weeks ago, Jenna. Uh, you know, I think that Suleiman Abu Ghaith uh, holds a lot of information in his head about the relationship between uh, Iran and al-Qaeda. We learned about it from the 9-11 Commission report. There were a lot of uh, questions that went unanswered. Uh, the Commission asked for more information about this from the intelligence community. The intelligence community has failed to deliver that. And in the meantime, now we have somebody who can shed a lot of light on this, in, on, on this relationship. And what we do is we rush him to court rather than holding him. Uh, so I, I think that uh, these uh, four chairmen are right to demand answers. What's your take on Robert McFadden, and that is it, the man that just made that point that he felt confident with the court system, about, about his, his feeling that this sends the right message to the world about trying these terrorists in court. What do you think the message is to our enemy? Well, this is a, a pre-9-11 mindset. In other words, uh, before 9-11, we looked at terrorism uh, largely as a legal issue. We would throw the book at terrorists, but we were, we were not preventing attacks, and we were not doing enough to dismantle these networks. What we're doing is, because we've had a few successes, notably the, the elimination of Osama bin Laden and a few others, we're going back into that mindset. I think we're letting our guard down, and this is a problem. We have an opportunity to interrogate. We don't have to interrogate for years, but we could interrogate for days or weeks. Uh, before we get uh, to the point where we're ready to hand somebody over to the legal process. Some have argued that the right people did get to this particular individual, but some also question that. So we'll let that debate play out over the next several weeks and months. Jonathan, I wanted to ask you about another terror bus that we've just learned about. Um, some are calling this an intelligence watershed. It's a young man, he's 25 years old. Apparently he had links to al-Qaeda both in Africa and beyond. And we just learned that he's been in our custody for two years now. Uh, tell us a little bit about this sort of process. Here we are seeing someone go through the legal process for two years versus someone that's going through it in just a few weeks' time. Sure. Well, this is an individual who's tied to uh, al-Shabaab in Somalia, uh, who had links to al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen. And it's a great example of how if you use somebody as an intelligence asset and you can interrogate them, you can get that treasure trove of information. This is what we should have been doing with Suleiman Abu Ghaith. Uh, this person uh, was able to reveal multiple ties between these two al-Qaeda affiliates and help our intelligence officials uh, get at that, the, the, uh, the core of these two uh, franchises and help weaken them significantly. It tells us an interesting story though, doesn't it? We have one man who was recently in Iran who had worked with bin Laden in custody. We have another man, much younger, who was working out of Somalia uh, and Yemen. What does this tell us about the changing face of al-Qaeda and, and our war against, against terrorism? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, this uh, this one individual, Warsame is his name, uh, really demonstrates the uh, interconnectivity of what we call the al-Qaeda franchises or al-Qaeda affiliate groups. Uh, we know that there's been a shift within the al-Qaeda uh, network, that the headquarters, so to speak, has, has been weakened significantly, and so that they have shifted to the uh, to these affiliate groups. And, uh, and what we now see is the interconnectivity of them, that al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula is reaching out to al-Shabaab, and they're selling them weapons, and they're providing them assistance and you can get a real sense of how they all now operate they're not uh, they're not next to each other so to speak but they find ways of cooperating you also get a sense of how AQAP Al Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula is now looking at uh, at the Horn of Africa as perhaps that next frontier in jihad and that is something that I think uh, American officials will need to look at very carefully real quick here Jonathan in your in your research work look at all the people that we have been able to arrest and and, and get into our custody but the ideology remains. Why? 
Well, the ideology is something that has been instilled in these individuals for quite a long time. This is something that, that stems from uh, proselytization from Saudi Arabia. It comes from Iran. It comes from the epicenters of, uh, of militant Islam or Islamism. And this is something that we've not been able to get at. And, and uh, it's a long war. Uh, there's no way that you can defeat this overnight. It's one of the reasons why I think it's extremely dangerous to say that uh, we're winning the war on terror, that al-Qaeda is defeated. It is going through changes. It is going through a metamorphosis right now. We need to be incredibly vigilant right now to watch the way that this is changing and to try to continue to weaken them tactically and also to try to figure out how to make sure that a moderate version of Islam wins the day. We'll continue to watch this story as it moves through uh, New York's court system. That's where these two gentlemen are at this time, to, in, in our understanding. In the meantime, some of those bigger questions remain, and we'll continue to tackle those as well. Jonathan, great to see you as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.